but it's an oceanographer who evaluates the output from a forecast ocean model to support a given customer base. Um, there's several of these that do these, this for fisheries and actually make really good money doing this for fisheries. Um, but our customer base is, of course, the Navy. So here, when I say forecast, this is what I mean. So the ocean model forecasts are evaluated against observational data for accuracy of the forecast. So this is truly more like what if you went to weather.com or your favorite weather site and you clicked on, you know, forecast of the day where you actually get a write-up from their forecaster who specializes in a specific geographical area that knows all the new nuances of the model and can tell you if the model is doing well are doing poorly because they've looked at the area, they looked at the data, they know the difference between the modeled reality and the actual reality of what the atmosphere does. So in that they're actually going to provide a write-up with appropriate graphics if necessary and um, feature placement, strength, and reliability of the output. So our, our support is the Navy Warfighter and so the type of support we provide, where most, of, most part our job is to characterize the ocean with primary focus on identifying and validating the strong ocean features, not validating the model, validating the features, our front seen in the ocean model output. That for us, it's all about sonar performance. Because our models, once we go into regional modeling, we're looking primarily at anti-submarine warfare. So for us, it's all about not just the ocean, it is about acoustic propagation in that ocean. So, but that's just our basic job. We actually, on any given day, can be asked many myriads of questions, and I'll actually go into a few of those um, in a minute. And sometimes we have, we get if a call at 10, and they want something before we leave at 4. So it, you better know your oceanography, because you might have to regurgitate it very quickly. So for our standard ocean forecaster product, this is what we call the front slide. The front slide is a geographic picture that has overlays on it that says where the fronts are, where the currents are, where the eddies are. If they have, for the fleet, have any operational boxes, that's what's in the white. So they will probably be operating in those areas. Say they want to know how the features impact where they're going to be. And other things of interest is like around Hawaii, you get a lot of variability in the lee of the big island because of the winds. And so that can affect their acoustic propagation throughout the day. This is followed up by a one-page write-up that fully discusses all these features in detail. Behind that is a series of slides, and it's usually about six slides. Here I'm only going to show four. So we have means, and we use means because acoustically the features pop out easier in means. If you use a one-time time slice picture of an ocean model. It has a tendency to be very noisy and if you're looking for feature placement because of slight slosh it makes everything a little less, um, it's harder to be confident in placements. So we use a 24-hour mean, usually the last 24 hours of the model run for so 72 to 96 hours. We also put on top, besides for here's just current magnitude and color, direction with arrows. We also overlay sea surface height. Because most of our customers are meteorologists, they like to look at their isobars. Um, and they have figured out that the sea surface height gives them a very similar idea to isobars in the atmosphere. So here you can see that just as, as they would expect and as we ex would expect, you get fairly circular um, sea surface height lines around eddy features. And so this also helps us in the placement, even though we're looking at more than just SSH. But it also gives our end customer a confidence that what we say is there is really there. Um, we also give temperature, and then we give it at multiple depths. So same slices. This one is at 30 feet, and we are in military, so they use feet and not meters. Sorry. <laughs> and then we, this is another at 330 feet. So the, the thir 30 feet is pretty much, for us in the model, the model doesn't change much surface to 30 feet, so that's pretty much a surface slice for us. Um, there's 30 feet is because all their sensors are at the bottom of their holes, which is at approximately 30 feet. So um, 30 feet, and this is 100 meters, are kind of are two of our standard depths that we give. 
And of course, for Hawaii, you get down to 100 feet, and all the eddies pop out in the temperature. So this is another reason why we look at multiple depths, because you get down deep in the eddy features, which is what affects the acoustics. You can actually see it. Now, that's for our real-time forecast. We actually do um, a lot of planning documents. So they're like, fleet is, okay, we are going to be in X location in July. What are my conditions? Okay, it's January. February, I'm not quite to July, and my model only forecasts out seven days. So what do you do? So we do have climatologies. We have a whole series of climatologies. This one, GEDA, which is general, Generalized Digital Environmental Model, has about a million profiles in it that was used to um, create a climatology of temperature and salinity. So we can use this climatology to say, okay, approximately these are the conditions you're going to see done on a pretty much a 100-year average of data. The data goes back to about 1880. But you can see when we go to climatologies, you're really smoothing out your answer. So often we won't give them just that picture, we'll actually give them both of these pictures so that we can say, okay, that's an average, but on top of that average you need to know that you're going to have all these other little features that could influence um, your activities. Now for an ocean forecaster, you have your model data, you can look at it and see what the model says, but you still have to know what reality is. So part of being an operation of ocean forecaster means you, you go look at not just the model, you look at a lot of data, and you do this every few days. So this source, SSHA, is one of our quick and dirties for us to say, yes, the model is doing well or the model is doing badly. Um, this is very much a large-scale data source that tells us if eddy and front placements are correct. So NAVO gets three, and as far as I know, these are the only three that are even up right now. Um, Altica, which is owned by the Indians, Cryosat, which is owned by the Europeans, and Jason II, which the U.S. is at least a partner in owning. All this data comes in. It is time delayed. We do not get it the day it's taken. It is quality controlled. It takes about three days to get the data in. But you can see the coverage and the time cycles vary. So that leads to big data gaps. So here we have a seven-day average. The little pokey dots here are the actual values of the altimeter tracks overlaid on model data. So it's it's a good quick and dirty, but we can't do a one-to-one -one comparison because the satellites are, are calculating the anomaly and the models are calculating the SSH. So the anomalies have a mean that's been removed and the models have a bias in them because of the way the models are initialized. So I can say by looking that yes, this is a low, yes, this is a high, yes, that's a low, but I can't do a one-to-one -one saying Okay, my A says my delta from low to high is, you know, three centimeters. I won't see that same three centimeters in the model because of the differences between the bias and the mean between the two data sources. Okay. But, of course, the altimeter data can save us or it can hurt us because here we have an area, if I had an exercise right here, the altimetry would not help me at all to say whether or not the model is good there or not. It's a data gap. I may have that data gap three, four, five days, and I have no way of validating the model without the altimetry data for the feature placement. It can actually get really bad. This is an area, this is actually Gulf of Mexico, that said, okay, these are merging. That's going away. That's what the model was trying to do because it had no data. And then once it got an altimetry, feed across it, it realized, oh, there's an eddy there. I can't close that space up because once it finally gets its, its data, it corrects itself. Um, we actually had a case in the global model in last fall where a Gulf loop eddy had actually um, come off and, and was um, south of Louisiana, and that loop eddy um, hit a data gap in SSHA 
and the model removed it. So, you know, loop eddies are pretty big. It's, you would think it would be very stable in the model, but the, without the observational data to tell the model to keep the eddy there, the model actually got rid of it. And so it, it got one data pass, and miraculously, the eddy was back. But, but the model actually did remove it. So the, the altimetry data is crucial. It's probably with the data assimilation. It probably got some other data that it thought was contradictory. Okay. All right, so other ways that we validate, we also use um, ocean drifters. NAVO puts in a lot of ocean drifters, and there are also other sources um, that put out um, drogued and undrogged drifters, drifting buoys. The model does not assimilate anything from the drifting buoy except for its temperature. So it doesn't know anything about its um, movement through the water. It gets no current speed or anything from, from the drifters. So it's kind of an independent data source. So here we have a six-day model mean that sh clearly shows an eddy. And the gray triangles in this case are um, the actual drift pattern of the drifter. You see that mar max matches up fairly well. Obviously, there's either some small scale or some inertial type motions in the drifter that the model doesn't carry a catch in a mean um, plot. So you can say, well, probably not quite exactly right on the shape of the eddy, but yes, the eddy is actually there. We also use SST. SST, yes, goes into the model. It's assimilated. But we all know most data assimilation methods aren't 100% accurate. So we do do validation against SST. Um, for what we use, NAVO gets all the satellites listed here, which is almost everything that's available. I think there's a couple out there that we don't get, and we get most of them. This is a warmest pixel. All the white is cloud cover, so it never got data in the white areas. Um, so we can use this to validate against. And so here we have a regional model that we're running for the North Arabian Sea. And you can see, if, of course, this data is a week old, so I don't expect it to be perfectly identical to a one-day, one-time snapshot of the model. But I can see that the front's in about the right place. There is um, warm water coming down um, the coast in, in the southern part of the Gulf of Oman, and I can see that there's upwelling which the model also captures. Probably one of my, our biggest friends are in situ profiles. This gives us a reality check off of the um, SSH. The SSH is, a, is assimilated in the models, and it is projected in the vertical um, through what are called synthetic profiles. The synthetic profiles are created using statistics and uses the GDOM that I discussed earlier to get, in general, the right shape of the um, profiles in the vertical. So here I have um, five that correspond to the, um, the five plots you see. Most of these, like this one and this one, you can eyeball and see. Oh, those are pretty good matches. One of them has maybe a little sea surface temperature problem, but overall they look really good. I can also go back because one of the things about being an ocean forecaster, you get so used to looking at a body of water that you don't even really have to think about it anymore. I, I can look at this one and I can go that's actually, for purposes of anti-submarine warfare, that's perfect match because for acoustics it's the gradient that's important. So because these parallel each other, that means my gradients are right. So acoustically, that is a perfect profile. may not be perfect oceanographically. There is definitely an offset. But acoustically, it's perfect. Here, because of where I know it is and because of the shape of the profile, I know there's probably an eddy there and the model is missing it. And same thing for the one on the far, um, far right. Um, those are just things you learn. You look at so much of this data day in and day out, you can start picking out and saying exactly 
why the model's wrong and how it's wrong. Now, sometimes we get these profiles in and we have to kind of question whether or not it's a good profile or not. It doesn't really match the model. The area is highly variable. Is it, does it fit in to what it should fit into? So NAVO has a data set called MOODS, the Master Oceanographic Observation Data Set. This one has about 8.6 million records, including temperature profiles, temperature and salinity profiles, and sound speed profiles. These 8.6 record, million records, of course, go back till in the 1800s. It's a very, very long record. So we can go back and we can say, I have all these blue ones are historical profiles. I have a red one that was measured. I can see how it compares to the Novembers that we have in the data set for a particular location. Um, I can also look at my model. The black here is before the red profile was assimilated to see if the model is predicting in the right range as well. So these are actually, even though the black one that from the model is not the same profile as the red one, it does follow within the bounds that the data <coughs> says. So it's still, it would be a possible profile, but it's just not the accurate profile. We do get customers that come in and say, I want a normal, you know, May in this location. And we'll go back and we'll pull these profiles and we'll find the one kind of that falls in the middle would be a typical um, profile. So this data set has many uses. Now we also, for the U.S. East Coast, Gulf of Mexico, and for um, our Pacific interest, we have to be aware of tropical storms, so hurricanes, typhoons. We have what is predicted by the um, Typhoon Warning Center, which is stationed in Hawaii. This is their prediction, just like we get ours from the National Weather Service for hurricanes. The um, Typhoon Warning Center does it for the Pacific. So this is their track. This is what they say that this Tropical Storm 12W is going to do. Okay. So taking that, the triangles <coughs> are what the Typhoon Warning Center says this typhoon is going to do. The red, or, or the, the moving image colored background, is what the atmospheric model said it was going to do. COAMPS does have an issue with tropical cyclones. It has a version, there is a tropical cyclone version of the COAMPS code, but it is centered on the typhoon. It is not made for operational ocean model forcing. So this is one thing we have to know. We have to go in and, and do these type plots so that we can tell our customers, of course, the, f the upwelling up underneath the hurricane, or downwelling, upwelling, upwelling, under, underneath the typhoon is not going to be in the right <coughs> place. It may not be the right strength. And so we have to be able to go back and tell our customers that Yes, the atmospheric model is not forcing it right. Pretty much everything you see under this path, move it one way or the other so that it actually aligns with what the storm is actually going to do. And this is another, so you can see the, here this is what the atmospheric model says that the winds are actually doing the strength. And um, the model says it's not going to be stronger than 40 knots, but the Typhoon Warning Center says it's supposed to be up to 60. So there is discrepancies. One of the things that we have started looking at um, since we started running the regional models are internal waves. Uh, the global model has no tides in it, so it cannot do internal waves, waves in its current form. When we get our upgrade to our 125th degree high com, I think it's supposed to be next year, it will have waves, uh, tides in it, so we can get internal waves in the 125th degree high com, but we're not there yet. So right now the internal waves um, only exist in the regional model because it does have a tidal model sitting inside of it. You can see that here the red are the observations at the tau buoys and the blue is the regional model output. You can see, yes, the, the thermocline is bouncing like it should for internal waves, but of course they're not bouncing together. We have found that there are 
um, phasing problems between the two. Most of this is because the bathymetry in the regional models are not as precise as the real ocean. And this does cause phasing problems in the model. We have also found that if, unless you have observations that are feeding the model continuously, the internal waves have a tendency to not have the amplitude that a real wave would have either. So we have found that using gliders especially are really wonderful for giving us um, fast enough data to really nail down the amplitude of internal tides. So here are just two um, cases where we actually have um, this is your um, power spectral. So that you can see that yes, it's, mis it's picking up the diurnal, inertial, semi-diurnal frequencies like it's supposed to, but um, they're not matched. Now I stare at this and I'm go I look at it and I'm saying they look like they're plotted backwards. They are not plotted backwards. We have verified that. Um, that's just the difference between the way the bathymetry is handling from one side of the ridge to the other. And this is just a temporal look at um, the thermocline depth at 125 meters between the two. And you can see, yes, there's some lagging and delay, and there's definitely some amplitude problems. But the model is trying to, to do that internal wave activity. It just can't quite, quite get it. So usually when we have this, and there's multiple places in the ocean where these occur, we usually qualify our statements this way. There's going to be variability induced by the internal waves that the model just can't replicate. Okay, so those are our major support that we do, is that, that forecast. But we're not limited just to forecast. We do other things as well. Um, one of the main ones we do are drift predictions. Um, so anything, th this is search and rescue usually. Um, but it can be, we have gotten calls, the Navy had five pieces of equipment out and they left one. Where could it go since I accidentally left it in the water? Um, we've gotten calls about um, a whale carcass washed up in X location. Where did it come from? Because they want to make sure that their acoustic sensors didn't actually kill something. Um, <laughs> so we get, a, we get a lot of different ones. One of the ones that is probably one of our saddest things we do, we do do for all of the um, plane crashes that have occurred in, since 2006. We've been doing this. We've done this for um, Air Asia. We've done this for Air France. We did this for both um, um, Asian airlines that uh, crashed in the past year. Um, pretty much it's usually we found wreckage here where did it come from? So we do hindcast for drift products. Um, Air, this one, Air, um, Adam Air in 2006, we actually, they did find the pinger. We estimated it was going to be along this line, and they actually found it at the top point. So, um, and that's one thing that also our Navy, our hydrographic ships do and do often. The, our Navy ship found this pinger. It found Air France pinger and it actually recovered the um, boxes in both cases. So 